The internet has changed the way we live. It has changed the way we work, the way we shop, and even the way we date. It has also changed the way we kill. I'm Donald McIntyre, and I'm on a quest to explore the dark side of our online world, where one click can lead to murder. The internet and social media has been a godsend to online predators. Why? Because of the speed in which they can, one, create fake profiles, but two, access victims. I'll be investigating some of the most disturbing crimes in recent history, where the internet and social media have been used to trick, torture and kill innocent victims lured into a virtual world where nothing is as it seems. Clearly, she did not realise the person she was talking to online was the man who was going to kill her. In this programme, Stefano Brizzi used a gay dating app to hook up with police officer Gordon Semple for sex. But when Gordon went round to Brizzi's flat for their online date, he was never seen alive again. How did Stefano Brizzi use social media to lure his victim to his death? And why did an online hookup for an afternoon of unattached sex end in murder? Nowadays, with the click of a button, we can have what we want, when we want it, and that even applies to sex. One in four Britons has a dating app on their phone and can hook up with a new partner in a matter of minutes. But as PC Gordon Semple discovered, sometimes convenience can be fatal. On April 1st, 2016, Gordon Semple was looking for sex on the gay dating app Grinder. After firing off multiple messages, only one man got back to him, Stefano Brizzi, a former city worker who worshipped Satan. He invited Gordon to his flat, and the pair played kinky sex games. But when Gordon was tied up and helpless, <laughs> Stefano turned on him, murdering him just two hours after they first met. But it's what Britzy did to Gordon's dead body that left everyone sickened. I'm on my way to central London where PC Gordon Semple worked and died. And I want to understand why a respectable police officer would put his entire safety on the line for an afternoon of sex with a total stranger for a deadly hookup that would cost him his life. On the surface, PC Semple looked like he had it all. A supportive family, a long-term partner of 25 years, and he was well-liked by everyone who knew him. Gordon worked with his colleagues here at Westminster City Hall, where he is a senior officer in the Antisocial Behavioural Unit. He'd been in the police for over 30 years and was widely regarded by colleagues as a caring, gentle and quiet man. Gordon was a soft, sort of like a, a sort of teddy bear in a way. He was a very gentle speaker. I'd often say to him, speak up, Gordon, I can't hear you. He whispered, he always whispered. I think it was like a secret. He spoke more about his family, I think, than about himself ever. Uh, he would always tell me about going back up north and, and seeing his family in Scotland. Just a very kind gentleman. The community of Belgravia loved Gordon. They loved his sense of humour. They would all ask for Gordon by name. They knew him well and they trusted him. I think Gordon was seen it's like a dad or a brother, an older brother in some ways. You went to Gordon for advice. 
But Gordon Semple was not all he seemed to be. He had a voracious appetite for sex and a way of acquiring it, totally unknown to his loved ones. Away from family and from work, he was an avid user of the online dating app Grindr, an app for gay men seeking casual sex 24-7. On Friday the 1st of April 2016, after lunch with an old friend in central London, not too far from around here, Gordon signed on to Grindr, seeking casual sex with a stranger instead of returning to work. Despite his long career as a police officer and his standing here in his local community, few of his colleagues or indeed members of the public knew anything about his personal life or indeed his sexual orientation. He has a relationship, a long-term relationship. But on the other hand, he presents himself as a straight man in work. When Gordon joined the police service, it was a very hard place to be gay, to be different, not to be an average English white football-loving bloke, was to be different. Within the last 10, 15 years, that's changed dramatically. So myself and probably three other people in the station knew that Gordon was gay. I think as my role as an LGBT liaison officer dealing with uh, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender issues, he knew that he, I was safe to talk to. I've come to meet author Matt Todd, who was the editor of the UK's top-selling gay magazine for eight years. He's been researching cases like Gordon's, exploring why even today, Revealing your sexuality can have serious consequences. I don't think it's massively unusual that someone would not be out at work. I think there was a recent survey that said only 45% of, uh, of LGBT people were completely out at work. And I, I think sometimes people feel that there is prejudice in the workplace. But I think sometimes people feel a certain shame about being gay. Because it is, even though the world has changed, the, the world is still quite hostile to, to LGBT people. And also remember that, you know, he was an older man. He would have grown up through this time where you could actually be fired for, for being openly gay, you know, at work. So I think people do feel a lot of shame. And so it doesn't, it doesn't I mean, it's shocking and, it, and it's upsetting, but it's not massively surprising. And PC Sample was clearly very good at keeping secrets. Gordon's long-term partner, had no idea he was a regular user of Grindr. With just the push of a button, he could search for potential partners nearby to hook up with for sex. Different codes on their profile denoted what kind of sex they were into. People were very certain about what they were interested in. So some people wanted to be dominant, and there was a whole vocabulary around that. Some people wanted to be subservient, and there was a vocabulary around that. And it's clear from looking at Gordon's grinder messages, he wanted to be dominated by another man. That shocked me, because if anything, I would have expected it to be the other way around. He, although he was very softly spoken, he held a power within him, and I would have expected it to be him being the master. Gordon was able to use the dating apps to locate men who could dominate him, all the while keeping his fetish hidden from those closest to him. His partner was unaware of his online life, but certainly by all accounts, their real world relationship was perfectly normal and harmonious. This shows that individuals like Gordon Semple are able to live multiple lives in both the online and the real world. In April 2016, Gordon was spending a significant amount of time on Grindr, and being at work didn't stop him using the app. During his shift here in central London on April 1st, Gordon was already canvassing sex partners on Grindr from 10.27 that morning. By 2.06, he'd already messaged three users, telling one that he was looking for a hot, dirty, sleazy session, and another that he was looking for no-strings-attached sex now. The next message, the fourth he would send just a minute later, would be the fateful one. It was also the first he would receive a successful reply to.
Gordon wasn't looking for danger, he was looking for sexual relief. The problem in Gordon's case is that he was desperate. He needed sex there and then that afternoon. He'd had many successful meetups with different people and it hadn't led to anything disastrous happening. I think it gave him a false sense of confidence that it would all be okay. He was putting himself in a vulnerable position. He was willing to take chances that he might not ordinarily take because he had urges that he needed to satisfy. On April 1st, 2016, PC Gordon Semple used the gay dating app Grindr to hook up for sex with a total stranger, former city worker Stefano Brizzi. It's a decision that would prove to be fatal. It's really interesting to see that these two men, with apparently very little in common, would want to have sex together. But when you look at their online interactions on Grindr, it seems that being available for sex right now was the only encouragement they needed. Gordon signed on to Grindr on Friday the 1st of April and sent out multiple messages looking for no-strings-attached sex. He had no idea where his hookups that day would lead. We do know from their grinder history that both men were interested in dangerous liaisons and fetish sex sessions with strangers, often with the use of a variety of illicit drugs. But when they connected on that fateful Friday afternoon, what do they really know about each other? Who was Britsy? What kind of man was he? Fritzi was born in Italy and came to the UK later on in his life, but we know for him that his religious upbringing clearly had a marked and significant impact on how he viewed his sexuality. Fritzi would have grown up thinking that if people knew the real him, they wouldn't love him, they wouldn't respect him, they would think he was dirty, they would think he was sinful, they would think, as he said himself, that he was from Satan. And in the early 2000s, one event enforced Britsy's own belief that he was evil. Britsy was diagnosed with HIV. He saw this almost as if it was punishment handed down from God on high. Having a Catholic upbringing in Italy, Britsy felt his homosexuality made him sinful. So in 2012, he moved to liberal London, looking for a fresh start. When Britsy first came to London, he was not that dissimilar to Gordon. He was passionate about his career and had a very well-paid job as a developer with Morgan Stanley. However, the newfound freedom he found amongst the London gay community and also the explosion in dating apps led him into a habit of casual sex and also a dangerous addiction to crystal meth. Ritzy's state of mind was going to be affected by the drugs he was taking, absolutely. There's just, just no way that he would be functioning normally. Britsy's drug use overwhelmed him and started to affect his work. He was having hallucinations. He was in meetings at work and suddenly talking about tying men up. Um, his behaviour became more and more bizarre. Britsy was realising that his addiction was getting out of hand and he attended a self-help group for crystal meth. Within the sanctuary of the group, Britsy shared alarming details of his private life. Members of the group were shocked by Britsy's honesty about what he liked sexually. I mean, he was talking about people tying people up and being very violent with people and they just found him bizarre. Despite attending the self-help group, Britsy's drug addiction spiralled out of control. I think the point that Britsy lost his job is really critical in his downfall. He's taking more and more drugs. He's on Grindr all the time, morning, afternoon, night. It's part of his life. Grindr has over two million worldwide active users every day and can be accessed from anywhere, home, work, even a local cafe. One of the most fascinating aspects of this app for me is just simply how easy it all is. The search, 
the sign-up, the sex, it can all be done in just a matter of minutes and all without anybody realising who anybody else is. So I'm going to try and sign up to one of these accounts and to see how anonymous I can be here and now to arrange a hookup, or in the case of Britsy, to find the victim to murder. I've just put in a uh, bogus email address, but one I'm connected to. I've put in my password, my date of birth. I declare myself 20. How about that? And off I go. I've set up my profile, and it's taken just 40 seconds for me to receive my first messages from strangers nearby offering me sex. Now I have a plethora of men up here, so offers to message me. And there's no photograph. I haven't offered a photograph. One man here giving a full name, giving his age. Uh, he's a kilometre away. I mean, if I wanted to, I could message and maybe arrange a hookup. And it doesn't appear to be terribly discerning, particularly as I'm pretending to be a 20-year-old and I don't have any profile uh, photograph up. It's extraordinary to me just how vulnerable people on this dating app are and how they're prepared to meet and have sex with strangers without even seeing a photograph to take them home to spend time with them. Many users seem to accept their vulnerability because the dating app offers so many rewards. One of the advantages of internet dating is its an anonymity in that where people were embarrassed or felt that they would be judged by having sexual fantasies that didn't meet the norm, such as sadomasochism, they can now go online and meet like-minded people and meet up. He had a loving relationship at home. He wasn't looking for a loving relationship. He was looking for quick, easy, and his words, dirty and sleazy sex. And at the same time he was secretly looking for dirty and sleazy sex, Gordon was phoning his long-term boyfriend. Just looking through the police evidence about the case, it's clear that Gordon's telephone history reveals something quite unusual. From the same phone, and more or less at the same time, as he's firing off texts to total strangers looking for sex, he's also trying to arrange evening dinner with his long-term partner at their local pub. Hey. It's me, I love your key. Gordon's partner had no idea about his secret double life. Just how did he manage to do this so successfully? How common is that, that one partner will lead a secret life and completely unbeknownst to the other? Open relationships are perhaps uh, more common amongst, amongst gay and bisexual men and something which, because it's, it's, it's two men and they, you know, men have very intense sexual needs, so that's something you can discuss and it's not frowned upon uh, amidst the LGBT community. So I'm surprised that, uh, that he wasn't, wasn't open about that. That's, that's quite unusual. Gordon's final secret journey was caught on CCTV as he made his way to Britsy's central London home, arriving at 3.03 p.m. At this point, there's no online activity for an hour. Just after 4 p.m., both men started messaging again on Grindr. They wanted to set up a sex party. These apps where people can meet up with strangers instantly, if they want to, are obviously creating a landscape where people like Britsy can very, very easily have access to a victim. 
So it seems, just as the two men had finished their first sex session, they couldn't wait to invite other people around for more sex. This is a key turning point for me. Why would Britsy invite more people to his flat, potential witnesses, if he had murder in mind? I'm meeting with criminologist Dr Liz Yardley and psychologist Mike Berry to try and gain an insight into what was going through Britsy's mind before he killed Gordon. Well, the curious case of Britsy. Can anyone explain why you would invite other people to a murder? Well, it would seem absolutely ludicrous, wouldn't it? That, that if you were planning a, a murder, the last thing that you would want would be more witnesses. So what on earth is really going on? If it was his mates, and they talked about it and fantasised about it, you could understand them saying, well, come over, we're going to do a killing. But I can't imagine anybody in any mind saying to a complete stranger, pop over, we'll have a killing. It does seem extraordinary uh, that he is inviting you know, potential victims and potential witnesses to this crime scene. I think what's essentially gone on here is that Gordon has gone round to Britsy's flat and they've had a good time together and they want the party to continue, but something else has happened in the meantime, which means that things just don't go to plan. On Friday, April 1st, 2016, PC Gordon Semple was looking for casual sex. He used the dating app Grinder to meet a complete stranger, Stefano Brizzi. It's a decision that would prove fatal. After an hour-long sex session, both men sent out messages on Grinder, trying to recruit more men to join their bondage party. But when the sex game started, things turned deadly. Gordon was happy. He was telling people how, you know, good-looking this guy is Italian, come round, let's have fun. Whereas Britsy was starting to feel something very different. And I think that was probably the start that he was becoming in a very different mood. When Gordon turned up, I think it, he wasn't what Britsy was expecting. I don't think he was into it as much as he, he thought he would be. So I think he was quite passive aggressive at that point. Gordon had no idea the danger he was in. He enjoyed bondage and liked to be tied up, but on this occasion, it left him helpless in Britsy's hands. His chronic drug use reduced his impulse control. The idea of strangling someone to death popped into his head as Gordon was in front of him. His inability to be rational because of the drugs is why he possibly went through and continued to strangle Gordon. <laughs> Britsy is in his apartment. He has a dead man in the bedroom. <sighs> Somebody was on Britsy's doorstep and rang the buzzer. Britsy would have panicked when he realised the enormity of his situation. One of the grinder users Britsy messaged earlier was now outside his flat. Britsy, after a few minutes, he said, we're having a situation here. Someone fell ill. We're taking care of it. The party's cancelled. Later that night, Gordon's partner reported him missing. But as he didn't know he was on Grinder, he never thought to look there, and nor did the police. Nothing was heard from Gordon for six days. It was entirely uncharacteristic of him to vanish without trace. 
and his loved ones were beside themselves with worry. On the 7th of April, almost a week after the murder, neighbours here, though, reported a foul-smelling stench emanating from around Britsy's flat. Neighbour Martin Harris lived in the same apartment block as Britsy and remembers the distinctive smell. God, it was terrible. Terrible. It smells sweet, and then you get an acid, like, citrus smell. And once it's up here, you'll never forget it. And I thought myself, this ain't wrong here. Martin Harris was so concerned about the odour that he went to see Britsy. It looked like he just got out of bed. He didn't show any panic, nothing. Cool as a cucumber. What smell? And he went, Stinks. no problem, he's not cooking for a friend. There were nothing in his eyes that, 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 that would have said to her that there's a dead body in the bath. CCTV footage from this shop, just a short hop from Britsy's own flat, later confirmed exactly what he was up to in his flat and, of course, the source of the stench surrounding it. He buys the things that he needs to buy in order to dispose of the body in a most horrific way, a way that he learned from a programme that he was really obsessed with, which is the Breaking Bad series, where in, the, in Breaking Bad they dispose of a body in a bucket of acid. Gordon's death was clearly very rational and cogent. Plenty of CCTV footage of him, even images of him measuring the size of buckets, putting buckets over his own head to see if perhaps it would fit a human head in there. Having bought all the tools he needed and inspired by the TV series Breaking Bad, Britsy returned to his flat and commenced the grisly task of cutting up Gordon's corpse. Clearly, we have a man who is further along the, the psychopathic spectrum. He's not frightened of the consequences. He's not frightened of dealing with a dead body. This man is not somebody who's thinking like the ordinary person at all. He's Machiavellian in his planning. He shows no remorse. He shows very little panic or anxiety over what he's done. Britsy was well on his way to disposing of Gordon's body and destroying any evidence that he'd ever been at the flat. But I have to think at this stage, did he really think he would get away with it? And what do his attempts at disposing of Gordon's remains tell us about his state of mind and his motive for murder? I hope experts Dr. Elizabeth Yardley and Mike Berry can help me better understand the evil lurking within Britsy. So why do we think Britsy killed Gordon Sample? Well, I think that potentially it could have been a, a situation where that they had been playing very close with that line between you know, something that's, that's enjoyable and something that's dangerous, and, and perhaps it, it went too far. So what do you think his attempts to dispose of the body says of Britsy? I think, to me, it says here we've got somebody who is quite cold, who's quite detached, because he's, he's dismembering the body of his victim, and he's not disgusted by it, he's not repulsed by it. There's going to be a lot of, a lot of gore, a lot of blood, and, and yet he's, he's still carrying on with the task of just disposing of this body that we know has become a problem for him. The way he disposed of the body is painting a portrait of a potential serial killer had he got away with this particular murder. Well, this is very much about modern consumption, isn't it? I've got what I wanted, now I, I've, I've had my pleasure, time to move on. So I'm going to dispose of, of this product or this service or this individual. Mike, does this start out as a murder with a fantasy to dismember the body afterwards? No, I think that dismembering the body is the way of getting rid of the body. I don't think that's the real kick. I think the real kick may be in the killing. 
It also very similar to men, men get involved in autoerotic games and they get to the point of strangulation. And every now and then you'll find somebody dead through autoerotic games. This could have been slightly extension on that principle. When Stefano Brizzi killed PC Gordon's sample at his London flat after connecting on the gay dating app Grinder in April 2016, he thought he could get away with murder. Brizzi attempted to dispose of Gordon's body in the days after the killing by cutting up the corpse and dissolving it in acid. But with the smell of rotting flesh filling Brizzi's apartment block, police were alerted. We've had complaints about the smell coming from your flat. Smell? Uh, no, 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 no. I'm cooking dinner. According to the police report, Britsy greeted police officers at his front door wearing nothing but a pair of pink underpants. When they entered the flat, the smell of acidic chemicals and rotting flesh was overpowering. He answered the door in his underpants, which is quite interesting, actually, because in Breaking Bad, the, the character Walter White there's a scene where he's making the crystal meth in his underpants. Thank you, sir. You can come back. PC Edwards at the scene asked Britsy if there was anything he wanted to say. And he replied, I've killed a police officer. I killed him last week. I met him on Grinder and I killed him. I tried to dissolve the body. What they saw, I, I, I suspect, will live with them for the rest of their lives. It was an absolute scene of carnage. It was a truly horrible sight. There were bin bags with body parts and, and parts of the carcass in the bin bags. There were buckets full of uh, substances that, that the police would not have been able to tell straight away uh, what that was. And it was clear that something very nasty had happened in this flat. Britsy had also tried to dispose of parts of Gordon's body in the River Thames. Bizarrely, he said that when he threw some of those body parts into the river, he said a small prayer because he felt it would be a nice way to make a funeral on the River Thames. It just shows that somebody who'd murdered somebody at the same time was trying to do the right thing. Stefano Brizzi was very definite that Satan had told him to kill, 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 and that he was possessed by the devil. He called himself evil and referred to his gayness and meaning that he was evil. Following their gruesome discovery, the officers took Brizzi to the police station to be questioned. Is there anything you can tell me about what you did between the 1st and the 7th before you were arrested? Um, no comment. Britsy had confessed to Gordon's murder to officers here at his flat, but back at the station, he claimed that Gordon died as a result of a tragic sex game gone wrong. When confronted with his previous admission and the talk of satanic voices in his head, he simply said, no comment. Britsy didn't want to go to prison. It would frustrate his life. If he changed his story to go for um, sex game gone wrong, that would mean probably no jail time uh, for an accident. But this clear evidence, this was no accident, but a conscious choice to kill. If you are going to strangle somebody, you can actually make somebody unconscious within 20 seconds, maybe 15 or 20 seconds. If you stop strangling them at that point, they're going to come round and they're going to survive. <laughs> 
To strangle someone to death takes minutes, not moments. It was clear Britsy had deliberately killed Gordon. Pathologists examined Gordon's remains and found bruising and marking consistent with strangulation. They also found high levels of ketamine and GHB in Gordon's tissue. I wonder how this could have affected Gordon's ability to resist Britsy's murderous advances. That would have a profound effect on him. He would have been in a very vulnerable situation because he, he wasn't able to escape at the point that he realised it was going wrong. Engaging in drug taking takes away your self-control and you may engage in activities which you would normally not consider acceptable. Discovering Gordon had taken drugs stunned those closest to him. Finding out that Gordon had drugs in his system was another shock. It's like, it's a bit like saying your granddad's been taking cocaine. I also think that the, the amount of drugs taken were certainly going to have an effect on Britsy in the way that he was thinking. Um, he'd been taking many drugs over the last few days. He hadn't had much sleep. So he would have been in quite a disturbed frame of mind at the time. When police returned to Britsy's flat to forensically examine the crime scene, they found something that was truly shocking. I don't think anything can prepare any human for this because it goes into such uncharted ground. The whole thing is almost a fantasy. It's peculiar. There was clear evidence that in an effort to dispose of the body, Britsy had resorted to cannibalism. There were bite marks on Gordon Temple's ribs, and of course there was DNA evidence on the chopsticks. So from that, the prosecution surmised that Stefano Britsy had almost certainly taken part in some sort of cannibalism and eaten parts of Gordon Temple's body. Cannibalism is one of the most evil acts we can engage in. For some people, that's one of the most grotesque human acts possible. Britsy probably felt this is what you have to do if you're a Satanist, and he was just ticking the boxes from his Satanic Bible of what he felt he needed to do because his life had so little in it. The detail of the cannibalism of the dissolving of the body, of the chopping up, up of the body, was shocking. This was a human being we were talking about. He was someone's brother, he was someone's son, he was someone's lover. And it was shocking to hear what had been done to his remains. Good morning, I'm Commander Alison Newcomb and I'm going to read a statement to you. This is a very sad day for Gordon's colleagues. There are many officers who have served with Gordon in London during his 30-year career who will acutely feel his loss. Thank you. Britsy appeared before the jury at the Old Bailey charged with murder, an accusation he denied. Stefano Britsy was one of the coolest people I've ever witnessed in court. He was very, very calm, and there was no sense of emotion or reaction to anything that was being said. Despite his pleas of innocence, Britsy was found guilty on all counts. On December 12, 2016, he was sentenced to life imprisonment and ordered to serve a minimum of 24 years in jail. I don't think there's any doubt at all that Britsy would have gone on to kill other people. 
and he was too comfortable with violence, too comfortable with bodies, too comfortable with the, um, the sexual assaults, he wouldn't have stopped. Gordon's murder and Britsy's harrowing attempts to dispose of the body would be shocking in any era. There can be little doubt that without their connection through a dating app, that PC Gordon Semple would still be alive today. I hope criminologist Dr Liz Yardley and psychologist Mike Berry can cast some light onto why Gordon risked his life for casual sex. As a policeman, might he not have been much more aware of the dangers he was exposing himself to? Well, you'd think so, yes, but, but I think we've got to remember that, that when you have that quite distinct dividing line between your personal life and your professional life, you're putting on different identities at, at different times and on different days. So, so on the day that, that he, he set out to meet Britsy, yeah, perhaps he didn't have his, his copper's hat on, his copper's head on. Perhaps he was, he was thinking about other things and, and those, those risks and those dangers just simply weren't at the forefront of his mind. Do we think the killing of Gordon Sample could have happened outside of the era of social media? Yes. In many ways, all, all the social media does is speed up the process of contact. But he could have easily picked up uh, a guy, gone back with him, and the same thing could have happened. Now, he's a policeman, so people could say, well, surely he would have smelt danger. My argument would be that he, if he's aroused and sexually interested, that often overtakes any sense of sensibility. And I think we also need to, to look at, at who is actually using apps like these. So obviously you have people who are looking to hook up with others in the area that they're in at the time. But are some of these people vulnerable people who aren't going to be missed? Um, and as criminologists, we call them the missing missing. Gordon was, was missed. People, people picked up on the fact that he wasn't around very quickly. So I think there are some incredibly vulnerable people in society who could be using these apps, who, who really do put themselves in an awful lot of danger. What was it about Gordon Sample that precipitated the murder? Might it is, it is it the case that, that someone was going to die that day and it just so happened it was Gordon Sample? I think Gordon was just an unlucky person in the wrong place at the wrong time. I don't think the murder would have taken place that day. I think it's quite likely a murder or attempted murder would have taken place in the near future. Liz, what kind of online killer was he? Well, I think when you look at some of Britsy's behaviour, it's quite predatory, isn't it? He's, he's going out there, looking at this app, looking at who's around, who, who fits what I'm after. He's essentially going fishing. So, so I, I'd say that he's definitely a predator. Despite Britsy being sentenced to a minimum of 24 years in jail for this horrific crime, he served just two months. On February 5th, 2017, he took his own life in Belmarsh Prison. When I heard that Bitsy had committed suicide, I was in the slightest bit surprised. I expected him to. Um, and although he won't suffer prison, if prison is, a, is in it to suffer, uh, I don't care. I don't care about him. <clears throat> I don't care about anything about him, really. I, I don't have a feeling in particular about him. I'm still cold, and I think I'm still cold about busy, and I don't think I've yet felt an emotion quite yet. Perhaps later on in life, I will, when the police officer has gone for me. In this internet age, hooking up with strangers for casual sex is easy and fast, but so too is finding a potential victim to murder. If you're using dating apps, take care.